leaders in AI uh, innovation and thought leadership around the world. And so we want to make that available uh, for our investors. And finally, um, you know, we have a highly diverse and skilled talent pool. We have a lot of young, uh, young Canadians uh, with, uh, like I said, 62% have uh, tertiary education uh, skills. Uh, and we also have incredible quality of life, which I think with the interest in immigration is, is an example of that. Um, our six cities are amongst the world's top 100 best cities to live in, aside from the weather or despite the weather. Um, people still want to come to Canada and it can be a lot of fun. So I won't get into a lot of detail on, on these next few slides, but it really gives you a snapshot of, of where the investments into Canada are coming from. You can see traditionally the United States has always been our biggest, not only trading partner, but also FDI uh, investor. Um, it's not it's no surprise. I know we've tried as a country to diversify both on the trade side as well as from, from the FDI front, but the proximity and, and the, the, the strength of the U.S. economy makes it kind of a, an obvious, um, you know, big player in, in, in our, our FDI. Outside of that, you see um, the EU is, is second, um, and then you see the U.K. Um, China was up there last year. Um, this year, I'm, I'm not so sure that will, will hold uh, this year. There's been, given the, the announcement over the last uh, couple of days, uh, I think there's a lot more pivoting um, in terms of trying to reduce the influence of China. There's a lot of, um, there has been actually a couple weeks ago, there was there were announcements where the Canadian government forced three Chinese companies to divest their investments in uh, uh, in Canadian lithium companies. So so there there are geopolitical concerns that I, I think going forward will, will make uh, China probably a little less um, significant in terms of foreign investor. But they still have a lot of capital that they need to deploy. They still have a lot of technology that, that I think may be needed uh, in Canada and other places. But I think the Canadian government is much more uh, careful in terms of looking at those. Um, and here you can see over time, um, between 2017 and 2022, so you'll see traditionally resources has been a big, a big area for foreign investment in Canada. It's ebbed and flow. Um, you know, it's becoming. You know, the trend is that it's becoming less and less important in terms of uh, a foreign investment. We still see it um, in the energy sector, in, in the mining resource sector, especially if it relates to uh, the critical minerals that you need for battery production and things like that. But, but I think we're we're seeing a much more diversified set of investments. There's a lot coming into. I'm not sure these stats are collected by the Investment Canada folks. Uh, so I'm not sure what other services are, but some of those are fairly, uh, fairly broad. But they are. It does demonstrate that that as an economy, I think we're 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 being attractive to foreign investment in areas other than what traditionally we've been known for, which is resources. And this will tell you where the top investors by region. Once again, as you can see from from the U.S., um, China. I think, as I said, it likely will, will decline, but that just means that there are probably opportunities for investors from other Asian countries. I think we're going to see, at least I'm expecting to see probably more investments from from Japan, from uh, Korea, and other Southeast Asian countries, hopefully from uh, investors in Vietnam as well. I, I think in the past, um, Chinese companies were very, very strong. They When they enter into a bidding process for a business in Canada, it's very difficult for others to kind of compete because they can really overpay or pay a lot more than everyone else. Uh, so to the extent that they aren't as uh, able to invest in Canada, I think that opens the field for a lot of others. So I think we're going to see a bit more um, more activity on that front. So looking ahead, um, and these are my my own thoughts. I, I don't hold me to them. I think I, I think I'm right, but. <laughs> um, we're looking for probably a rebound. You can see that there was a, a dip in FDI during COVID, which is um, totally understandable. I think that was not unique to Canada. But I think as the recovery occurred, we're gonna see a, we expect to see a rebound in, in, in FDI. The, the shifting pattern of FDI, I think, as I said, before, from China um, and more from, from North and Southeast Asian countries. And surprisingly, I think we're gonna see a rebound in resource and energy sector investment, because I think in the current um, energy insecurity issues around the world. I think, once again, energy and, and, and resources, particularly um, in relation to critical minerals, 
I think that's becoming brought to the forefront. So, like I said, those those three cases um, where the Chinese investors were were told to divest their of their investments in Canada, I think it's it's a bit um, indicative of that shift. And in terms of industries, well, where we're seeing a lot more investments in Canada, um, electric vehicle supply chain, that's that's not uh, unusual. I know that, that Chinese companies have a, a fairly high uh, market share when it comes to lithium. They've been at it for a lot longer than, than, than most. I think, you know, to be honest, I think Canada, we dropped the ball on that one in terms of, of the supply chain, realizing probably late that, that lithium was really important to, <laughs> to batteries. Um, so the Chinese companies have actually um, have been able to obtain over the 20 years or so a huge market share, but they've also developed a lot of technology. And I think that's the one thing we're, we're, we're finding um, in that space is that, you know, the Canadian companies in that space need capital, but, and I think they can get capital elsewhere outside of China, but I'm not so sure of the technology because lithium isn't the same as mining gold or, or other metal. They're, they're fairly, uh, you know, different technological issues in terms of processing lithium that I think the Chinese companies have developed over time. So that's going to be an interesting uh, area. So, but we're seeing a lot more investment there. Life sciences is, is going to be, um, uh, has been very, very um, significant uh, over the last few years. We see a lot more uh, foreign pharmaceuticals and, and, um, and also um, biosciences companies coming into Canada. Uh, medical devices is, is a big area. Technology, um, as Kathleen says, AI is very important to Canada. I think we have one of the, um, you know, a leading AI center in Montreal. Uh, so, so I think that that's one area that uh, I think they're very proud of. The other area, which I think is here, is gaming. I, I didn't realize my kids play a lot of video games, uh, not surprisingly, but I didn't realize a lot of those games are actually uh, at least conceptualized by Canadian studios and then subsequently you know, purchased by, by other, um, other companies. But there's a huge gaming industry in, in, uh, in both Montreal and in, in British Columbia. Um, the other area we're seeing a lot of investment is clean tech. I think we're, we're seeing a bit more carbon capture technology investments in that space. We still see solar and, and, and wind investments. Um, agribusiness actually is the other one. Um, and I think it will be relevant for, for investors if they're uh, from Vietnam, if they're looking at that space. Um, I know that was, we were speaking with the folks in Singapore. They're trying to get 30% food sufficiency, self-sufficiency by 2030. Like, and I think so, so agribusiness is going to be important for them as, as a uh, type of investment. And I think to the extent um, the Vietnamese economy, uh, it, would, it surprised me actually that, that I, I was chatting with the uh, Minister of Agriculture for the province of Ontario. I didn't realize that, that they had exported so much pork to, to Vietnam. Uh, I would have thought, you know, you could raise pigs here pretty good. <laughs> but, but so there, there are things like that. So there's agribusiness there. I think because the Canadian companies have actually been very good at, at uh, scaling and, and, and uh, you know, trading efficient production. So I think those are, are things that, you know, investments from Malaysia we can see going into that space. On the agribusiness as well, I think, you know, Saskatchewan uh, trade offices here and they'll, they'll know more about it, but, you know, I know one of the interests is also a lot of the alternative protein sources, um, which is a big one. I understand that's uh, of more interest here as well. That's great. And so let's move on to establishing new business in Canada. From a foreign investment um, perspective, it's really simple in Canada to start a new business. There really, there isn't a, a um, approval required to start a business in Canada. In most cases, I say most cases because um, there is a discretion on the part of the Canadian government to review cultural sector investments. If you start a new uh, book publishing business in Canada, for instance, or if you start a business that may raise national security concerns, then the government has a, a, the ability, the discretion to subject it to a national security review. Um, but it's very rare, I think. So most companies who want to expand into Canada, they establish their business, they incorporate, they hire employees, they, they, you know, they do the simple reg business registrations, and, and that's it. And all they have to do is file a very simple notice to the Canadian government saying we're here. And you get a very nice letter back saying welcome to, to, to Canada. So that's on the establishing a new business. The other part is a little trickier if you're looking to um, acquire a Canadian business. So, and that said, I think it's going to be applicable very rarely. 
because it's based on a, a threshold. So the government will review investments into Canada that exceed certain thresholds. And these thresholds have been increasing over time, uh, and they're very big. So assuming that it's not a cultural business, non-state-owned enterprise investors, like from Vietnam, for instance, I think their investments into Canada would only trigger a, a net benefit review uh, and approval requirement if the enterprise value of the business they're acquiring in Canada is $1.7 billion. So that's a big number. I think the very, very few investments are subject to, to net benefit review. Um, if the investor is a, a state-owned enterprise, it's, it's a little, it's a different test. They don't look at enterprise value, they look at asset value. Don't ask me why they still have that, that uh, <laughs> it's a bit uh, archaic that they still use asset value, but, but for whatever reason, when it comes to state-owned enterprises, they, they want to rely on, on the, uh, the asset value. And once again, there is the discretion on the part of the, the, the Canadian government to invoke a national security review, uh, even though you, you don't fit within those thresholds. Uh, and the cases I mentioned to you earlier about those three Chinese companies, I think at least in one or two of those cases, the transactions were not acquisitions of control. They were minority investments, like small percentages in the Canadian company. And the Canadian companies actually had mining properties outside of Canada as opposed to in Canada. And, but that was still enough to, to um, you know, bring in the national security review uh, provisions. But that's, uh, that, that's rare. That's not, you know, I think I would say 95, 96% of the cases that we deal with, there's no issue. I think they're the very rare case where, where you have, you know, be it sovereignty issues, defense issues, um, that's where, where we, we may get into the national security. But I think it's, uh, and, and I suspect, as a practical matter, I think the focus now uh, on national security is probably China, Russia, uh, some countries in the Middle East, North Korea. Uh, so, you know, I don't think that national security review is going to be invoked in a lot of circumstances. Uh, oh, okay. So, what, this is the, the business immigration section. It's actually pretty lengthy. I'll let Kathleen start, and, and like I said, we, we can send this to you so the, the information is there. I don't know how uh, relevant this would be for this group. I know there were some questions when we were setting up this program uh, that Zach said there were, were some questions of, uh, you know, that people wanted to hear a bit more about how the immigration process worked from a business perspective. Oh, I'm doing it. Okay. Okay. So really there, there, um, there are four ways. If you're talking about business immigration, there's four ways to do it in Canada. Uh, one is the investment immigration. That's kind of passive investment. Uh, the startup visa program is another one. Entrepreneur immigration is the third one. The fourth one, which we deal with a lot actually, is intra-company transfer um, uh, work permits. So if you're transferring an employee from, from Saigon to Toronto or to you know, Regina, uh, I think the intra-company transfer uh, rules are actually pretty, pretty good in Canada. And lastly, I think there are rules on citizenship application, and we put that there because it really does contrast us with the, the U.S., for instance. It's much easier to get citizenship uh, and much shorter in Canada than it would be for you if you were to, you know, immigrate to the U.S. and then uh, get your green card. You have to wait a, a, a longer period before you can apply for U.S. citizenship. Um, so investment immigration. And this one, we it used to be a much more prevalent uh, program that happened that occurred across the country, but there were abuses over the years in terms of, um, you know, investors losing their money. Um, so it was, it's been tightened down a fair bit. And I think the only one that, the only province I think that has it now is Quebec. And it started, at my understanding that it's expected to reopen in April of 2023. But I think, so until then, we don't have a formal, um, you know, passive investment uh, category for, for immigration. And so the minimum requirements are there one is that you intend to settle in Quebec permanently. We always, you know, wonder about that because once you get into Canada, mobility rights and charter rights are such that it's hard to say you can't move. So that's an interesting um, requirement. Whether or not it's a it's a legal requirement that you know is binding over the your lifetime, I think it's probably up for a debate. Um, so the other the other criteria are there. Uh, as I said, happy to answer questions or or, or take questions by email later on. Um, so, so this is where you don't have to actually run the business in Canada if you want to make passive investment um, into into a Canadian business. And as long as you know, the criteria are met, I think 
the thinking is that will be um, that will allow the Quebec government to uh, to uh, engage in this um, this stream. The one interesting thing before I pass the mic over to Kathleen is that part of the Canadian government's Indo-Pacific pivoting, I think there was a, a, a comment that Canada wants to increase immigration by to 500,000, uh, I think, is it 600? 600,000 uh, immigrants a year. And and I think they're, they're focusing on, on um, you know, Southeast Asia, and in particular countries where French is spoken. So I think they still think a lot of French is spoken in Vietnam. I think that's probably not true anymore, but <laughs> they seem to think that a lot of French is still spoken in Vietnam. Um, I, th I think Cambodia and Vietnam are both explicitly laid out yeah, as they talk to you. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. My kids would qualify, but I don't think they need to immigrate. No, but they're bilingual, unlike me. <laughs> so. This is uh, some further information. It really is a point system. The immigration system in Canada is fairly transparent. It's based on points, right? And the investment um, program, it just gives you additional points. The thing that makes it very attractive is that, I think, because um, the applicant will also qualify to, to bring their, their spouse and dependents. And in Canada, depends, dependents, I think, include children under 22 years of age, I think, which is a, a little older than the U.S., which is 21. And you can see there the... The expected processing time um, for the, the Quebec Immigrant uh, Investor Program is about uh, 5.3 5 years. In the U.S., uh, the equivalent, uh, I think, visa is the EB-5 visa. It varies um, depending on where you're applying from, but I think I'm told by, by my uh, immigration partners that it's up to five or, or seven years, so it's, it's a fairly lengthy process. In either case, but I think in, in the Canadian case, it's probably a little shorter. So... Kathleen, you want to talk about startups? Sure. So the Startup Visa Immigration Program, so what is it? It is kind of what it sounds like. It's a program for entrepreneurs uh, to give entrepreneurs an opportunity to um, obtain permanent residency in Canada to support a business that they're starting. Um, the qualification or the, the prerequisite is that the entrepreneur must be able to demonstrate that their business is innovative. It will create jobs. And, uh, and that it can compete on a global scale. So here are some of the requirements that, you know, for the qualifying business that the entrepreneur hold at least 10% of the voting uh, shares or rights attached to all the shares of the company, along with the designated organization. And those designated organizations we'll get into in the next slide a little bit, but that together with that designated organization that they hold at least 50% of the voting rights attached to the shares of the company. Uh, they are required to have a letter of support from the designated organization. Um, and so this is, you know, a designated organization is either a venture capital fund, an angel investor group, or a business incubator. Um, and so the idea is that the entrepreneur has pitched the idea um, to, you know, these, these organizations, these designated organizations, and obtain support. Uh, there is a language requirement, and also the entrepreneur needs, needs, to, needs to be able to demonstrate that they have sufficient funds to support themselves and their family in Canada, and the requirement is Canadian $24,733. Where, where are they living in Canada? <laughs> I, was, I was gonna say, I don't, nobody ever told me that. That's what the, uh, that's sufficient to support, but I guess that's all you need to demonstrate, so that's, that's actually not bad. Um, now, so from, a, from the application process perspective, there's a couple of steps we've laid out here, again, just to give you an overview. But you have to obtain a letter of support from the designated organization. Um, and now these are specifically listed organizations on the government's website. So it's not just any angel investor, it's specific ones that have been vetted by the government. So when you go to the website, you'll find the list there. Um, and just a little you know, tidbit there from our experience, uh, the business incubators, I guess, tend to be um, more supportive. Uh, and so the second step is to apply for permanent residency. The processing time is about 32 months or 2.6 years. Um, and then you can apply for the work permit uh, to commence business in Canada while the application is being processed. So you're not stuck uh, in limbo while you're waiting. Now we're going to turn it to entrepreneur immigration and to Hui. So this... Um Entrepreneur immigration stream, um, it's a little different than, than some of the other ones. It's really um, set up for those who want to immigrate uh, to Canada 
to set up a business in support of, of uh, innovation and economic growth. It's kind of sounds a little bit like the entrepreneur uh, <laughs> category. Um, but here, the stream, this one is a temporary one because really the ultimate goal is permanent residency, but this one allows you to come uh, initially and work uh, while um, you know while your your permanent residency application is, is is being processed, and there are two provinces that have specific uh, programs for entrepreneurial immigration. One is British Columbia, so the uh, the criteria are, are, are set out there. You can see there are, are personal network requirements. Uh, you know there are educational requirements as well as um, you know experience in terms of the type of business you want to to engage in. Uh, there's uh, an investment uh, minimum that that um, that you have to to commit to, but all these ones are situations for unlike the the, the passive investor class. This one is where you're actually running a business in Canada, um, and the application process for British Columbia is is, is laid out here. Uh, you have to be invited to apply. So I think if you go, there, there are criteria on their link on the on the, the website, and you have to go through that and. And by filling out the, the, the questionnaire, I, I think you get a sense of where, where you would fit and then you would get an invitation to apply. And then once you, you apply, and if the application is approved, they have to, to sign an agreement um, and receive a, a letter of confirmation and you get a work permit for two years. And that's BC. Um, so this sets out the time frame um, um, and the processing time, I think is about 23 months right now for BC. So, uh, Ontario, there's a similar program in Ontario. There's a little bit uh, of a, a difference when it comes to, to the business experience. I think it requires um, you know, less experience. It requires a higher net growth. Um, it requires a higher personal investment. Um, and you can see it, uh, if you're gonna invest in the greater Toronto area, it's a much higher number than if you were doing it in other parts of the province. Uh, and once again, you have to create at least two jobs in Ontario, whereas in British Columbia, you'll need to you only need to create one job. Um, so the processing time, as I said before, it's about 23 months, um, including, uh, and so if you include the two year work period that you, the work visa that you get, I think it takes about four years to become a permanent resident under that stream. And, and as with some of the others, you, st you still have to, to satisfy language requirements, uh, be proficient in either English or French. Um, and intra-company transfer, I think this is cool. So intra-company transfer work permits are effectively, you know, work permits that allow international companies to move their employees uh, to Canada in order to improve uh, management effectiveness um, and to basically enhance their business as well as enhancing the effectiveness and competitiveness of Canada in the overseas market. Um, on the next slide, we've laid out some of the requirements. It's similar to an L-1 visa in the U.S., for those of you who are familiar with, with them. I am not as much, unfortunately. Um, but it does allow Canadians to gain work experience in order to become a PR, uh, if that is the uh, end goal. So we've also laid out here the Canadian experience class. Um, and there is this is a points-based system as well. So again, you know, these are one of those areas where we just say, you know, maybe give us a call. And like, as we said, we know a little bit about immigration enough to be dangerous, but we've got colleagues who um, know this stuff down cold and can basically navigate, help, you know, navigate through what is the most uh, efficient and most effective manner in which to proceed. And, and this probably doesn't apply here, but I think we had a, a very interesting scenario that happened last year, which it kind of caught me by surprise, but I guess thinking back, I don't think it, it, it should have surprised me, but. There was a company that was based in in in, in South Asia, uh, and I think they were losing a lot of employees because their employees wanted to immigrate to uh, you know safer or more stable uh, countries. So they were stuck. They were saying, "Well, do we open an office?" They had an office in California, and they they wanted to say, "Well, do we want to open an office in the UK?" Because I think their employees were were intending to resign and move and immigrate to either the UK or Canada or Australia or the US, and so they were trying to figure out how to keep their workforce because they're very talented, you know, these are engineers, right? So they're saying, well, we don't want to lose these folks. Uh, so they wanted to explore essentially establishing a business in Canada in one of the, the, the cities that would be attractive to their employees and facilitate essentially intra-company transfers so that these employees, you know, 
won't leave the company. So it's really a talent retention issue for, for that company. Um, it doesn't apply very often. It's the first time I've ever seen that, but it's, a, it's an interesting uh, spin on it. And All right, becoming a Canadian citizen, or as my grandfather used to say, although he said it in Chinese, was, you know, getting invited to sing the national anthem with a judge, which was, you know, you know, very proud and, and great thing for all of them when they got to do it. So um, becoming a Canadian citizen. So uh, once an individual has become a permanent resident or been a permanent resident uh, for three out of five years, uh, that individual may be eligible to apply for citizenship. Um, again, we're just contrasting this uh, to the U.S., which requires a five-year a period before application, Canada is a little shorter than that. Uh, there are language and citizenship test requirements, uh, and, and I remember my grandfather studying for that test, actually, um, but those are a way for PRs who are over 54 years of age, uh, which is, which is kind of nice. Um, now, you are, citizens are allowed to travel to the U.S. as a visitor without a visa for six months per visit, if that is of interest. And for those who are interested in working in the U.S., um, you know, there is an opportunity to apply for a USMCA work permit or an E-1 visa, which is an on, a non-immigrant classification uh, visa with the U.S. that allows a national of a treaty country, which is Canada, uh, for, the, for the purposes of this conversation, to be admitted to the U.S. Um, in order to engage in international trade um, on his or her own behalf. So... Yeah, I think that covers it. This wraps it up. This kind of summarizes like what we talked about in terms of why it's probably uh, easier, maybe a more uh, time effective process to, to do it through Canada than the U.S. It gives you a lot of benefits in terms of access to the U.S. Uh, uh, you know, markets and so forth. Um, the, the key takeaway, and I think we find this it's very important for our clients, is, is the family members, the accompanying family members. I think Canada is more lenient in the U.S. when it comes to that. And I think that's attractive to, to people who are looking to to move to Canada. Citizenship, as I said before, it's, it's, uh, it's shorter. Um, I, I can't remember when it was I was invited to sing the national anthem. It's been a long time, probably 45 years or something. But um, anyways, it's like the Canadian citizenship and the passport is, is, is amazing. I think it's so easy to travel. I, I traveled through the Middle East. You know, everyone has a Canadian flag on their backpack because they, you know, they don't want to be mistaken for, for uh, you know, a non-Canadian, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think it's it's a great passport to have. It's uh, you know you're welcome everywhere you go. There are very few places where I've I've, uh, I've shown up with my Canadian passport and and, and received a, a hostile kind of uh, uh, reception. So I, I guess the other plug is you know um, you may be familiar with Canada, but it is an incredibly diverse um, place, and so you know we really do have really uh, core connected communities of all you know, um, different cultures uh, all within. Actually, and in fact, I think one of our leading professors in international relations said that Canada is one of the most diverse in terms of concentrations of different ethnic populations from around the world, such that if you were to do a study, we would be actually be, you know, one of the, the, the broadest or the most representative of, of our uh, the world in terms of concentration in Canada for groups. And I think part of the, the draw for, for people like myself, and, and I don't want to speak for Kathleen, but the notion that you don't have to give up your your identity like in the u.s there's this whole notion of this melting pot everyone in the u.s has to be an american and i'm not sure what exactly that means but i think there, there are some very core things such as being ultra patriotic and all this other stuff um i think some of those apply in canada but i think in canada there isn't a backlash if you kind of keep your culture and and i think it, it's a great thing because you learn we get to learn from each other way more than otherwise would be the case uh if everyone were the same, I think it, it, uh, it'd be kind of boring. But I think the, the, the mosaic that we have in, in Canada has been great. Like I, you actually learn a lot about what people from uh, other cultures without actually having to travel. Although the travel is nice, so uh, that won't keep me from coming back to Southeast Asia. <laughs> so we're happy to take questions, or we can, you know, open up the bar and, and mingle. Yeah, who's, oh, we got one back here. Okay. Yes. Sorry. So have you encountered or have you uh, went through the process where um, can a Vietnamese investor buy a franchise in Canada and be eligible? Such as, you know, I want to buy a Zara franchise. 
It's about two, three million dollars in capital. Would I be qualified as uh, for the immigration status or not? I think in principle you would if you fit those, those criteria on the entrepreneur one. I, I think, you know, we want to get our, our, our immigration expert to, to kind of, you know, walk through the criteria and apply it to the individual. Because a lot, it's very, very specific, right? Because you need, you need the, the experience as part of the, sometimes that what, you know, you fall through that because you don't have the experience. So if the, the investor from Vietnam doesn't have experience running a franchise here, it's going to be hard for them to get that experience qualification. So it, it's very fact specific, but I think in principle, uh, I think it's open. Really? Okay. That, that opens up um, yeah. a venue, I think. Yeah, I, I think those ones we would, you know, our, our uh, partner who does this stuff is Daniel Lee. He, he sits in, uh, in Vancouver and, and he does a lot of this stuff. I think, you know, you know, a quick call with him will probably give you a pretty good sense. Uh, and he'll, he'll be able to apply those, those factors to, the, you know, the individual and, and say, okay, where, where do you fall on, on, this, uh, on this checklist and, and the point system? Okay. And then Faskin, do you have um, expertise in advising Vietnamese clients on... Um, moving money or moving the investment money from Vietnam to Canada? So if you're referring to export, like capital export controls, I think that's a, a matter of Vietnamese law. We, we, we don't advise on that, but we have a lot of relationship with the Vietnamese firms here. But once they, they, they get the money out and they want to, to invest it overseas, I think we're, we're very well equipped to do that. Okay, but so in terms of the, the export controls uh, and the capital so they have control, to get the money out. Wait, yeah. I mean, they have to do it on their own to get the money out. Yeah, so you know we, we can work with the, the, the local law firms here uh, to try and find the best way to, for them to, to do that. But really, it's a question of, of Vietnamese law, right? That we, we don't practice Vietnamese law. No. That's that's that, that's a that's a major limiting factor. Yeah, and it was know, the same for for China for, for everybody. Yeah, we, we had the same issues with with uh, Chinese investors as well. Okay, good, thank you. Any other questions out there? got to be some. Okay, so um, I guess I'll ask one. So if you were just sort of at the initial steps of, of looking, you know, to invest in a business in Canada, what are some of the key considerations or perhaps differences, say, for, our, for a Vietnamese uh, investor's perspective in Canada in terms of doing business? Where do you look at for different types of uh, investment options? Um, are there any key sort of considerations you would advise? Well, you know, I was very pleasantly surprised to see so many of the provincial reps, the Canadian like you know uh, trade commissioners and so forth here. Like they're a great source of information, really. Uh, so so I, I think and, and you guys as well. I think is the due diligence, right? And I think those people can point to the right direction. We can help in that process as well. I think we're, we're we get calls a lot from uh, from potential investors, but also on the other side because we see what's happening in Canada. We have clients who are looking to develop projects and things like that, and they're looking for capital. So I think oftentimes we can, can be the bit of the conduit. We're not the only one. There's lots of other sources. And, and you know, like I said, the, the, the trade commissioners and, and, and can Cham and, and other organizations like that are a great source of information because I think there's nothing uh, better than doing proper due diligence. And, you know, lawyers, we tell you all the time, I think we're, we're, we're a big proponent of due diligence because you don't, you may not know uh, what you bought into. So, so like I said, I think we're, we've been trying to, to be a, a helpful conduit and, and I think it, it's worked out in, in the spaces that we're involved in because I think as a firm we're so big we see so many transactions and developments that I, I think we have a good pulse in terms of who's looking for what yeah I think it's it's similar almost to, to what we talk about when we see Canadian companies starting to look at Vietnam one of the one of the key things of course is diligence and gathering information but also finding good partners on the ground so I think probably the same same rule would apply for sure yeah, yeah. and you know and, and the example I gave before, before one of the reasons why, why the, the, the passive business immigration stream was not successful it was because, you know, the government didn't do its job in terms of, of vetting those investment um, opportunities. And I think a lot of people lost money. And that's, you know, that's incumbent on, in that case, it was on, you know, people in, in Canada setting up these investment uh, vehicles, um, being a little bit uh, hard uh, or fast and loose with, with some of the, the rules and the government not, not being... Uh, on the ball on due diligence. So I think they've learned from that. But I think due diligence, it works both ways. I think you do want to make sure that, that you get to know uh, the jurisdiction as well, right? Because I think uh, there are some quirkiness in terms of dealing with Canada that you don't see in other places. It's not, uh, 
a barrier to entry, but it's just a way of doing business that's a little different. Uh, French language is one. Uh, I know we, we have lots of clients who are exporting to, to Canada and they're trying to deal with the language uh, labeling requirements. The labeling requirements are different. Um, so, so those are like, you know, they're not uh, game changers in terms of people don't decide not to come to Canada because of it, but it adds a layer of, you know, of, of complication. Okay. Yeah. Um, any other questions back here? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, you've actually got a very good educational system. It's not uh, subject to this because you're not educational consultants. Just one question. If you've had a, um, educated three children in Canada, right, and been through the Canadian system, which is, I must add, one of the best in the world, and they've graduated from universities, and you wanted to apply for Canadian citizenship or PR, is there an age, first question is, is there an age barrier? Uh, second question is, do you get credits that you've been very pro-Canadian? And third question, which I'm a bit confused about, is why are you focusing so much on Quebec rather than the rest of Canada? Is it because I don't speak French? <laughs> no, I think it's not so much us focusing on Quebec, but I think Quebec is very proactive in trying to attract immigrants and, and, and specifically um, uh, French-speaking immigrants. So because Quebec is very proactive, that becomes part of the incentives and they have programs that are different than other provinces. So I think they kind of created that that um, that focus as opposed to, <laughs> I don't think nationally the, the, the federal government is saying, you know, uh, although they are now saying they're trying to, to, to promote more more francophones, but uh, but I think it, it's a really uh, driven by the, the provincial government themselves. And so there is a bit, bit of a joke, although my you know, problems of Quebec hopefully will forgive me for this but when we talk about incentives for businesses that are coming to Canada or looking to come to Canada Quebec has by far the most in terms of opportunities and incentives and they're all stackable right so on top of the federal you've got a number of Quebec incentives um, Quebec people have kind of said to me that's to make up for their French language requirements which is why they've actually got all these incentives so it is just that they are promoting it uh, more but it I don't think we're here just to promote Quebec. We are here to actually just talk about Canada and opportunities for Canada. And I think, to be honest, um, we find more people are looking to to immigrate to Ontario or BC. If you're from Asia, BC and Ontario tend to make the most sense, just because they probably have relatives in in those cities. Uh, less so in Montreal, although there there are some. I think, uh, but I think I know that there were outflows, and at some point, uh, you know, there was a big Vietnamese community in Montreal for the longest time. Uh, you know, they've kind of moved around a, a bit. There aren't as many there as there used to be. Uh, but it, it's part of the, the, the federal system we have, right? I think I said, once you get into Canada, you know, the government can't tell you you can't move from Quebec to Ontario or vice versa. It's uh, it's one of those things. Yeah, and in terms of um, the answer to their spirit, your more specific questions, as we said, we both know a little bit about Im immigration enough to be dangerous. Uh, in my, uh, you know, my day-to-day -day practice in addition to Asia Pacific. I'm actually a financial services lawyer, so I do regulatory transactional work for FIs and non-FIs and payments. But what I will uh, say that we, I'll check with Daniel and we can just give me your card after, I'll, I'll send you a note after. But in terms of the education system, I think you're, you're right. I think uh, Kathleen and I are probably product of the public school system. Uh, my wife differs on whether or not the public school system is still what it used to be, because she has her kids in private school, but they're, they're in university now. And I, to be honest, I, I, I joke around. I said, you know, we paid for private school. It's, it's like an insurance policy so I can sleep at night and I can say I've done everything I can. And if they screw up, it's on them. It's not me. Because uh, I think when they get to university, they have to apply to university on the same scale as everybody else. And I think, you know, friends of ours whose kids didn't go to private school have done just as well in, in the universities. So I think we do have a very good, good system. Um, and I think that's one of the strengths because I, I think we have a lot of good engineers. STEM program is very, very big. Um, and they've actually encouraged a lot of women uh, into that, that stream. My daughter is in engineering, which I think 10 years ago would be very rare, but she says there are a lot more women in her engineering program uh, than in the past. And you, you see a lot of that. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, well, um, huge thanks everybody for coming and thanks of course we and Kathleen, it's a long flight uh, over from Toronto and a little bit of jet lag still lingering, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, stay, stick around, you know, we'll be around for a little while. So if you want to come up and say hello, 
um, please do so. Bar's still open. Um, but yeah, thank you. It was our pleasure.